Um, my name is Andrew Chia, and I'd just like to give a presentation on some of my work on the analytical modeling of a radial PN junction uh, nanowire solar cell. Uh, nanowire is missing from the title. All right, yeah, we're off to a great start. So the first, <laughs> you, might, you might question, or the first qu question that might come to mind is why nanowire photovoltaics in the first place? Um, and the main reason, uh, the main inspiration behind it is that it has very optimal geometry. If you look at the schematic that's shown on the left, as well as the band diagram, um, you can see that nanowires can be grown with a coaxial structure, whereby the core is, say, N-doped and the shell is, uh, say, P-doped. And what that allows, then, is that it results in a radial P-N junction, um, which then allows light to be co collected axially for maximum absorption, uh, uh, create electron hole pairs, which are then separated across the junction, and then, the, uh, and then the charge carriers can be collected radi radially for minimum recombination. So that was, and that's sort of the inspiration uh, behind nanowire photovoltaics. Now in addition, if you look at the dense forests of nanowires, they te generally tend to have very good anti-reflective properties, uh, which lend themselves very well for photovoltaics. But more unique and so sort of attractive uh, properties include these. Um, Due to the small size of the nanowires, it allows for strain relaxation along the nanowire sidewalls. And that opens up the door for the growth of 3,5 nanowires, say, on silicon or any lattice mismatched substrate. And that, that gives promise for, say, a two-junction solar cell with a bottom cell of silicon and a top cell made of nanowires, as we saw this morning. The nanoscale dimensions also hold promise for things like quantum dot enhanced solar cells and hot carrier solar cells. And we must note that the most, uh, these last two properties are only accessible if we use nanowires and not something like microwires. Um, so what are some current issues uh, that nanowires face today? Well, one of the big issues is that we found that if we decreased the shell thickness but kept the overall size of the nanowire the same, the efficiency would decrease. And so the main probable cause for this was the complete depletion of the shell due to surface states. And why this is a huge problem is essentially if we were to take a look at a generic band diagram of our core shell PN junction uh, nanowire, we'd, we'd get something like this. But because of the small dimensions of the nanowire, usually the shell is probably, probably looks like this. And that leads to a few really bad problems. The first is that the shell is probably completely depleted. And this probably lowers the built-in potential of the, sh uh, of the cell. And the second problem is now you have process B, which you don't want, comp uh, competing with process A, which you do want. So um, th this leads to a lot of surface recombination competition issues um, of these minority charge carriers. So clearly here, the shell depletion poses a major problem. Another issue is core depletion. If we were to go into to the opposite extreme, whereby the core is very thin compared to the shell, the core could be fully depleted, and that also lowers the built-in potential. So in general, then, the small nanowire dimensions, although they buy you some really nice properties, also lead to some problems, namely problems with depletion of both the core and the shell. And that leads to low efficiencies. Um, so then we, as, as, a, as such, we require then a model that can help us to understand uh, the depletion of both the core and the shell of these structures, um, and then subsequently optimize ideal dimensions for maximum efficiency. Um, so let's just jump right into the model. At, at its base level, the model solves Poisson's equation to get band profiles uh, in the nanowire. So we can express Poisson's equation in cylindrical coordinates and get a general solution in terms of rho, C1, and C2, which are constants, and epsilon, which is material specific. And today we'll look at uh, gallium arsenide as, as our material of choice. Now, to fully express this function, all we need then is rho, which is the charge density, and we have to impose some boundary conditions. So let's, let's look at rho. If we looked at, at a nanowire from the top down and we cut out a little pie slice, uh, we'd get a schematic which looks like this, where we have a core and a shell. Um, this red shaded region refer, uh, um, shows the space charge region due to the PN junction. And the blue shaded region refers, or shows the space charge region associated with the surface uh, depletion. Um, clearly, the, in the white regions where the quasi, uh, is where the quasi-neutral region is and rho equals 0, and if we invoke the full depletion approximation, we can kind of dig up our old PN junction knowledge and easily assign what the um, charge uh, densities are in each of the other space charge regions. In this case, we have a P-doped core and an N-type shell. And then we can write this mathematically in terms of some dimensions that you can see a little bit clearer um, down here uh, if we were to draw the band diagram. 
At this point, all we need to do is impose some boundary conditions, and then we can get the full expression for psi. And in essence, all the boundary conditions say are that psi, uh, which is the potential, and the electric field have to be constant throughout the nanowire. So we'll apply that, uh, that, um, that condition at the boundary inside the p-dope core, at the boundaries inside the n-dope shell, and then we'd get an, a big function that looks like this. I just want to draw your attention to three uh, quantities of interest that we need to solve for um, that are shown here. Now, the, the quantity in blue, which relates to the surface depletion width, uh, can be found just by invoking charge neutrality at the surface. And the, and the quantities in green can just be invoked by solving the boundary conditions at the junction between the p-dope core and the n-dope shell. All of this then uh, is, so all of this math, ma mathematics then just allows you to generate um, full band profiles by the model. And with the full band profiles, you can do a lot of things. Now, that's all fine and dandy. However, it, this calculation really only works, uh, or this derivation only really works in a specific case, where you have a partially depleted p-core and a partially depleted n-shell. But you could have, for example, a fully depleted p-core and a partially, a partially depleted n-shell. Or you could have a fully depleted n-shell and a partially depleted p-core. Or you could have a combination of case two and three, and you get case four, where the entire thing is fully depleted. And really, in each case, you'd have to solve Poisson's equation separately uh, to get the full idea. And we'll see later on that each case will affect the built-in potential, which has big implications on the performance of our solar cell. So let's take a look at one case first. Um, it is a a wire where, with a core radius of 50 nanometers and a total radius of 100 nanometers and a very typical DIT. What DIT is is just a, sur a density of surface states. And we get a plot that looks like this where each of the colors corresponds to one of the cases. The y-axis is the shell doping and the uh, x-axis is the core doping. And when we take a look at it, well, uh, we recover what we'd expect. For example, a very high core and shell doping, you'd expect for case one, partially depleted N shell and P core. If both the dopings were very, very low, we'd expect for uh, case four, where the whole thing is depleted. And we can do similar analysis, and we, and, and we recover what we'd intuitively expect for each of the cases. Now, this isn't really quite that useful, because it's, really con it's just a single um, uh, a wire with a particular um, core, diam uh, core radius and particular shell radius. So what we want to do, say, is let's, t let's pick a typical doping density of 10 to the 18. And we can basically plot out the same type of graph, except um, instead of plotting with the dopings on each of the axes, we can plot with AP, which is the core radius, and A, which is the total radius. And we can see a few things. So let's pick out a few points just to understand what this plot is showing us. So if we took, a, took this point here, which has a total radius of 120 nanometers and an AP of 60, we'd get case one. So here you can see that clearly because you see the quasi-neutral regions. Now, if we moved one over and made the core a little bit thicker but kept the overall size of the wire the same, then we'd run into the situation where we are in case three, which is the yellow region of the plot. And you can see this um, pretty well because we have a quasi-neutral region of the core, but the shell is fully depleted. If we walk in the opposite direction and keep the, um, the wire 120 nanometers in radius, but have a 50 nanometer core, we get this point number C. And here we go to the opposite case, which is case two, which has a fully depleted core and a partially depleted shell. So it's giving us what we'd expect. Um, and it's interesting how they change just by sh merely shifting uh, the core radius um, dimensions. Now we can move along the vertical scale as well uh, on a line of constant AP equals 50 and we can generate um, our band diagrams here as well. So if we were to keep the core thickness, the uh, core radius the same at 50 nanometers but reduce the shell thickness, what we run into is that now our, our wire is fully depleted. But interestingly enough, if we maintain the same core radius but reduce the shell thickness, the core goes from being fully depleted to now partially depleted. Um, and it's interesting because you haven't changed the size of your core, yet it just went from um, fully depleted to partially depleted, and that's because now we don't have enough shell material to actually deplete the core. So this is the case where the Fermi level is pinned at mid-gap, which is the classic case. If we decrease the shell thickness further, what we end up getting is the Fermi level pinned at the charge neutrality level. And if we remember our previous band diagram from before, since the, surface, since the surface states fill from the charge neutrality level up 
to the Fermi level, if the Fermi level is pinned at the charge neutrality level, that means uh, we have that the surface charge is zero, uh, or the field is zero uh, at the surface, as you can see by the flat bands. Lastly, if we have a one nanometer thick shell, we, um, uh, we're happy to see that the single doped, p-doped nanowire case uh, is recovered. Now, if you look at each of these band diagrams, you'll see that the built-in potential is constantly decreasing, um, or is constantly changing. So what might be more useful is we could plot this uh, on the same plot, the built-in potential as a function of dimensions. And if you compare it to the color scale, you'll see that there's a red triangle that we'd want to make sure our nanowire stays as far as dimensions go so that we maintain a high built-in potential. So we see here then that the lower limit, uh, that, that if we draw this line, if AP equals 52 nanometers, that represents a lower limit for what the core radius should be. And we can also draw a line of A equals AP plus 52 nanometers, and qualitatively, that means that we have a minimum core radius of 52 nanometers and a minimum shell thickness of 52 nanometers, so that we can get in this red zone whereby our wire isn't fully depleted. So if you compare the two plots that we looked at before, you can see that they overlay pretty well. And you think, well, what if we, say, reduce the density of interface states, which would be analogous to, say, um, passivating the surface of the nanowire? When we do that, we revert to a system that looks like this. So we'll go from this to this. So clearly, the red triangle is increasing. Our new line is this. So the number changed from 52 nanometers to 40 nanometers, so now our minimum shelf thickness is 40 nanometers. If we do that one more time uh, with an even lower DIT, uh, we get a lower threshold for the shelf thickness at 30 nanometers. So as, you're lower, as you lower the density of interface states, you can afford to have thinner and thinner shelves. Also, it's key, it's key to note here that here the, there isn't really much of a case for. So we could take all the plots that we just generated and put them on a big master plot and take a look at some um, other common dopings. So let's take a look at the doping of 10 to the 17. And what's interesting here is that it's never in case 1. If we look at the doping at 10 to the 19, we see here that it's mostly case 1, as you'd expect. So here, it's clear that doping, as you move from left to right for, for increasing doping, has a large effect on the critical core radius. Where, for example, at 10 to the 18, our critical core radius was 52 nanometers. But when you increase the doping, that, that's reduced to 25 nanometers. So now you can go an even thinner uh, rate, uh, nanowire uh, because of the higher doping. We could translate these to built-in potentials. And as expected, if we compare it to the color scale for the 10 to the 17 wires, the built-in potential is very low for all dimensions. And for the 10 to the 18 wires, the built-in potential is only high in, within each of these triangular regions which is only some part of the total space. And finally, for the highly doped nanowires, you have a high built-in potential over a large range of dimensions. But the problem here is that with such high uh, doping densities, you have possible tunneling through the junction. So it probably requires the imp implementation of some PIN structure. Uh, so in conclusion, I w I've shown that uh, nanowire solar cells hold the promise for lattice mismatch tandem cells and various third generation schemes. but Depletion effects pose a major problem because of the small size of the nanowires. And so what we did then was we solved Poisson's equation in four cases, and the main conclusion was, was, was that sur the surface state density dictates the critical shell thickness. So um, the, the lower the density you go, or the better passivated it is, the smaller shell you can use. And the doping dictates the critical core radius. The higher doping you go, the smaller, uh, the, the smaller radius you can go before it gets fully depleted. And so this really shows that effective passivation and uh, highly doped PIN structures are necessary to utilize 3-5 nanowires on, say, silicon cells. So I'd just like to end by um, thanking some funding agencies and ask if you have any questions.